It was the hand of God that brought you here for purpose. An apostolic people is not one person or two people going. An apostolic is all of us going. The apostolic means a people that have taken the gospel and they go with the gospel. Sometimes you go by giving finance. Sometimes you go by sending your trailer or your car. Generosity is key in this season. Great faith that's required and great sacrifice that's required. He wants to grow community like he's never grown before. Deep covenantal relationships. God just shining a light on your life groups. Lighthouse, don't forget. Don't forget, keep contending, keep pushing through, keep fighting, keep praying, keep having communion, keep in fellowship. And how do we fight? We fight on our knees. We fight in prayer. You'll fight for the supernatural. Seeing salvations day after day after day after day in the city. You are a lampstand in the city, in this nation, and in the nations of the world. Get ready to be that apostolic people. Amen. Woo! I love that video. It just stirs up so much faith in me. To just, oh, Lord, what have you got for us? There's been prophetic word that has been spoken over our church, and we need to be obedient, and we need to action it. Amen. Amen. Welcome, Lighthouse Church. Great to see you all. My name's Leon. I'm one of the leaders here, and I get, I get this opportunity every now and then to share the gospel of Jesus. I'm a, I get an opportunity to open the Word of God and share the Word of God with you, and I consider that a huge honor and a huge privilege and a huge responsibility. Sure, this, the, 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 Hein has got a, he's a great man of faith. I want to tell you, give me a mic to preach. Really, that, it takes faith, guys. You've got to give, it, give him credit where, where he deserves. <laughs> but I'm really excited about the season. I'm really excited about the series that we've started. And, and it really has, this is the third week of the of this series uh, where, where Hein has already covered uh, what a generous people look like. You know, when, when he ministered, it was, I just had a, a fresh revelation of my life not being lived like this, but my life being lived like this. You know, because when we live like this, God can't bless me. But when I live like this, God says, I can see a hand that's open that I can bless. Amen? Come on, man. Come on. This is great stuff. Last week, just the ministry on salvation. What is salvation? And this morning, this morning, I'm going to be preaching on a topic that I preach on monthly. Every, the, the, the last week of the month, we have baptisms. You'll notice we have a swimming pool here. It's in the form of a jojo tank. And, and, we, and, we, and we dunk people, right? We dunk like Omar Rusk, eh? Hong. <laughs> It's so cool. And, and uh, we get to do that. But on the Thursday night, I get to teach the people before they go on to the baptism, before they go through the waters of baptism, I have the opportunity to just teach on, on what are they actually doing on the next Sunday morning. And, and, and I was then asked, Leon, would you preach on Sunday morning on, on baptism? And wow, I was like, yo, I know this topic quite well, hey? I've done it, I do it regularly. And two, th two Tuesdays ago, I get woken up in the morning at, at 10, to, 10 to 2 in the morning, and, I'm, and, I, and God says, now you're quiet, now I can speak to you. And I'm like, oh, what does he want to say to me? You know, it's like just those words. And I, I get out of bed, Natalie's like, oh, Leon can't sleep again, off he goes. And I take my iPad and I go through to the lounge, and two hours later, I've got today's message written on my iPad. And I said, praise you, Lord, because this morning I believe I'm going to be ministering on baptism in a way I've never done it before. God has given me such a fresh revelation of the word baptism and what it means to us. Are you ready, church? <laughs> because when I was typing there, I was like, oh, Lord. <laughs> This is amazing stuff. This is amazing stuff. So, wow. Okay, good. Wow. So, so why do we need to preach on baptism? Why? You know, you know when, when Jesus, when we read the book of Matthew, we read 
the last words recorded in the book of Matthew was a specific verse. You know, I remember before my dad passed away, I had a phone call about two hours before he passed away. And I remember that phone call with my dad like it happened yesterday. I remember what we were talking about. I remember what he said. And, and I want to tell you, when Jesus said something, the last words he said to, to his disciples before he ascended to heaven, according to the book of Matthew, was Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. These were the last words of Jesus recorded according to the book of Matthew. And it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Last words of Jesus. Don't you think we need to take note of that? You know, there's three verbs I want to just highlight in that portion of Scripture. The first word is go. The first word is go. The second verb there is make. The third verb there is baptizing. The fourth one is teaching. And this morning, I trust this teaching is going to be something of a reality of what we need to be doing in terms of going and making and baptizing. Amen? Amen. So at some stage of the preach today, and I'm giving you this warning, I'm putting it out there, I'm putting it out there. You may seem, Leon, are you teaching on relationships this morning or are you teaching on baptism? Well, I'm going to tell you today, just trust the process. You want to trust me? Yeah. All right, please give me a gap. I'm, I'm, I'm in it. Trust the process because at the end of this preach, I believe God is going to reveal something to the people that are here this morning that have never been baptized. And I want you to just do this one thing. Listen to what the Holy Spirit tells you to do this morning. Amen? There are a lot of people here this morning that I know have been baptized. And this morning, I'm trusting and I'm in faith this morning for you to walk out of these doors this morning with a new revelation of your level and where you are with Jesus right now and your relationship with God. Amen? And what he tells you to do in terms of that revelation, can you please do it? That's my encouragement to you here this morning. Amen? So can I ask us just to close our eyes? I want to just pray for us. Lord, I pray for each and every person here this morning. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are present in this place here this morning. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to, to move in our hearts, that you would move in our minds, that you would cause new and fresh revelation here this morning about your word, what your word is speaking to us, and that our eyes would be open to it and that we would walk into that thing that you've called us into. Help me, Lord, preach your gospel, your word here this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Okay. So I need to also just say my notes that I've got here this morning, I, brought, I said to my wife last night, my wifey, I need you to come sit next to me because I need to go through my notes with you <laughs> because my notes are very applicable to what has happened in our lives. And I said, I do not want to dishonor you in any way, but I want to honor you in every way this morning. Because this morning I'm going to be sharing a bit of our testimony of when Leon met Natalie. Not when Harry met Sally, right? It's when Leon met Natalie. And, and for me, it's just such, it's been such a revelation as God was revealing to me this word baptism. There's just been such a revelation of where we are in our levels of relationship, in our levels of relationship with one another, with, with, with you and God. Where is your level of relationship with you and God? And so the first level of relationship that I want to talk about here this morning is level number one. Right, we always start with level number one, and it starts off with, I want to know what I don't know. I've called it that. I've given level one a title, okay? And there's a reason why I've done that. Because the day, the day I met Natalie, this is what happened, <laughs> This is good. This is good stuff, guys. 
Our church was invited to, to, to come and minister and go and minister in, in a small town called Freyhate in, in northern Natal. And, and so we took a team, we got together, and off we went down to Freyhate, and we arrived at the church, and there was no one there. And, uh, and uh, it just so happened that the people living across the road from the church were in the church, and they saw us arrive, and they said to us, please come sit in our lounge while the pastor arrives, and, and, and he'll open up because we're going to be ministering that Friday night at the church. And, and we sort of stood around and some people sat down and I was standing there sort of half behind the front door where people were coming in. And, and I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. Uh, there was a, a young lady, the, the lady whose house we were at, her daughter walked in and she so happened to be Miss Freyhate at one stage. And, I, and, I, and I, saw, I saw her walk in and I was like, sure, that's a pretty girl, you know. And, and she walked in, and I was like, okay. But right behind her, about three or four meters behind her, walked this beautiful blonde. And she walked in, and she walked in, and I was like, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> and, I, and I actually, I was standing behind the door, if this is the door, and I kind of like looked to see, is there a row of very beautiful women going to be walking in here? And I just realized, whew, my goodness, there's now a really pretty girl. And, and, and this is me, guys. I'm talking from my point of view, okay? So, and I realized, sure, that's, that's, that's quite a good-looking girl. I hope, I hope this weekend is going to be a time where I can at least, uh, I want to know what I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get to know her a little bit, to find out who she is, that sort of stuff. And, and uh, lo and behold, she was the youth leader of that church, and so I was the youth leader of this church. And I'm like, oh, we've got commonality. This is great. This is all working in my favor. So I, I, we carried on, and we had a great weekend. It was a great uh, ministry weekend. And, and I managed to get her telephone number very slyly. I won't go into that. But I got her phone number, and I started, we started phoning each other. And in those days, it was only about 22 years ago, we still wrote letters to one another. We wrote letters, and I remember writing a letter to her saying, yeah, here's just a word of encouragement for your youth. <laughs> Take it or leave it. And I'll never forget one of the letters that was returned to me from her. The one day, I, I, I got it in the post, and I was like ripping it apart, ripping it open, because I want to read what she's, what she's written to me. And I got a whiff of something. I was like... I was like, yeah. And she had squirted some of her perfume on, on this letter. I was like, yo, she's into me, man. She's into me. I've got this, man. I've got this. It was really cool. I want to tell you something. Level one, level one level of relationship is when I walked into a church one day and I could feel Something different. There was something different. I started and I, was, I joined a youth group. And, I, and I, when I joined the youth group, I felt, man, there's something amazing. There's something in the air in this church. And I felt in myself, man, I am interested. I want to know what I don't know, what's happening. And that was my level of my relationship that started in getting to know who God is and what Jesus did for me in my life. That was level one that I just stepped into. And I don't know if you can relate to what I'm saying, but at some stage in your life, and you may be in that stage right now, today, where you've walked in here for the very first time and you felt something when we were worshiping. Yeshua. Yeshua. Do you know, that's not Jesus spelled wrong. That's just the Jesus version in Hebrew. That means the Lord saves. That's what we were seeing here this morning, and the Holy Spirit was here. And I want to tell you something. There was something in the air in this place here. And I want to tell you that you're in the stage in your relationship where I want to encourage you to get closer and closer and get to know God more and more and more in your life. Amen? All right. Then we come to stage or level number two. I don't like stage. It's sort of connotations to something else that we're living in these days. So level two. 
was the next level which Natalie and I stepped into. And I call the next level. And I didn't name it level two, actually. If you look over there, I've named it level 1.5 because it doesn't qualify for a level on its own. Okay, because nothing really has changed. All right, and the next level <laughs> is called the draad sitter. You know, you know when you invite some friends over, and sometimes there's always this guy you don't really know, but he's come over and he's, he's enjoying the rugby with you because uh, he, we're watching this, the box play New Zealand, and, this, this, and you ask the guy, so we're all supporting the box, and this guy's like, no, I don't really know. I don't know who I'm supporting today. Draad sitter. Draad sitter. That's what we call it in Afrikaans. It's where you're sitting at a stage where Natalie and I got to a stage where we were such good friends that she needed to know, I knew where things were going, but she needed to know Leon, and she approached me, and I was like, whoa, this is, this is shaky ground. And she approached me, and she said, I need to know where we're going with this relationship. And I was like, we're friends. And she's like, but I need to... Am I, she didn't say it in this way, but she was, am I wasting my time with you? That's how I interpreted what she said very nicely. She said, are we at least girlfriend and boyfriend? And I said, yeah, sure, cool. <laughs> I literally said it like that. And she was like, sure, that didn't sound like much of a commitment. Eh? I want to tell you something. At that stage, on that level of relationship, I wasn't looking for a girlfriend. I was looking for a wife. And I want to tell you something here. This is where the enemy comes in, in many other, in, and I'm talking relationships in general, where the devil is trying to say, take your friendship to another level. Take your friendship to another level. Now, fortunately, this isn't applicable to Natalie and I. But when things become more physical in a relationship, that's where the devil steps in. And I want to tell you now, if you are coming to church and you're getting to know Jesus, the devil's not happy with that. He's not happy with that. And he doesn't want you to take it to the next level unless you make some sort of a commitment. There's no other thing. The devil has a shortcut. I want to tell you something. And he will try and rob you at every level of relationship that you're in with God. He will try and destroy it. He will cause you to be discouraged in any way whatsoever. And this morning I want to tell you something. There is the next level. There is a next level. But it does take some sort of a commitment to get to the next level. And at this level 1.5, that commitment hasn't been found yet. Yes, no steers a draad sitter. I was still seeing, is this girl a girl I want to marry? Is this, where am I with God? There's lots of, if I can say, altar calls where they say, do you want to give your heart to Jesus? And you're sitting in the back there and you're saying, I don't really know yet. I want to encourage you this morning, get over the draad sitter stage. We need to make a commitment. Because last week, Hein ministered so powerfully on salvation. Salvation. And so what happened was, <clears throat> what happened was, 17 months later, 17 months later in Natalie and I's relationship, we took it to the next level. We took it to the next level in the godly way. In the godly way. And I've called level two, which is level two now. I know what I need. I'm going for it. I'm going for it. And I want to tell you something. This was where I found myself visiting some jewelry stores because, because I love her, I'll put a ring on her. Because I love her, I'm going to put a ring on her. And I'm going to make a proposal to her. I'm going to make a proposal. And that what happened there was I organized her parents, my parents. We meet on a weekend on the farm where my parents were. And that weekend, I made a very big, bold statement. I approached the father. <laughs> and I said, Uncle Ed, that's what he was. He wasn't my dad. I said, Uncle Ed, I need to speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. I'd like to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage would you bless us? Would you bless us in giving me and supporting me in, in, in uh, marrying your daughter? 
And boy, he, he was, it was almost like he had this thing prepared. But boy, did I get a lecture. <laughs> I got a lecture there. And he said, dra, 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 dra. he gave me the ins and outs. And I said, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. And he said, then I'll bless you. I'll bless your marriage. And I want to tell you something. The day you make a decision, and I've called it, I know what I need, and I'm going for it. It means you get up out of your chair when you say, when we put an altar call out there and we say, who in this room has never given your heart to Jesus? Would you come to the front right now? That you go, I know what I need, and I'm going for it. And you come to the front. And you give your heart to Jesus. You accept the proposal. Where God is saying, I'm making a proposal. I'm giving you a free gift. I'm giving you a free gift of eternal life. Would you respond to me? And I'll never forget, we walked, I took, her, I took her for a walk through the farm, and there was another farmhouse that overlooked the orchards and the mountains. And on the, on the front veranda of that, of that house that was standing there, there was no one there. There was no one there. It was just Natalie and I. And I went down on my knee, and I said, Natalie, will you marry me? And she, she grabbed me, she hugged me, and she said, yes, yes. I'll never forget it. Never forget it. And so there was a proposal and there was an acceptance of the proposal that happened right there and then. I want to tell you something. We need to get to that stage in our relationship with Jesus where we accept the free gift of eternal life. Where you personally, it was Natalie and I alone, there on that little veranda, overlooking that beautiful scenery, where she said, I accept your proposal. I accept your proposal. Proposal, And I want to tell you something. It's where you come in your relationship with God and you say, God, forgive me of my sin. Thank you for what you've done on the cross. I have had a fresh revelation of what you've done for me on the cross. But it doesn't end there. That's not where it ends. And I want to encourage you here this morning. If you are at the stage where you've given your heart to Jesus, that is a great stage to be at. But it's not the end. It's not the end. Because you know what happened? Seven months and 17 days later was our wedding day. We got to our wedding day. And I've called this level three. Level three. And I've, and I've named this level, I'm all in. Hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> Hook, line, and sinker. I'm all in. Because you know what happened? On the 10th of February, 2001... I stood in front, of this, in front of this church and my wife and her dad came around the corner and I looked at her and I thought, oh, wow, you look amazing. And I stood there and my heart literally was pounding in my chest. And I thought, this is it. This is it. You know what happened? We invited all all the friends we could invite. We invited all the family we could invite. The church was full of people coming to witness Natalie and I getting married. Because right there in there, that day, I still remember she walked down, her dad lifted her veil, and we came and we stood together, and the pastor still said, don't look at me, look at the people. So we stood next to each other, looking at the people in the church, and he said, they've come to witness what you are going to do today. The witnesses, I've come to witness what you have purposed to do today. And what we did was we, we exchanged vows. We still wrote it down on a piece of paper because everyone says write it down on a piece of paper because the moment's very big. You're going to forget your words and then you must just read it. So we had these things in our back pockets. And, well, I had the, one, hers in my back pocket and mine in the other back pocket, right? And we remembered our vows and we spoke our vows and we, I said, Natalie, I'll be your husband. I'll care for you, cherish you. All the things that I needed, I can't remember them right now, okay? But, but I do know I made that promise that I cherish and care for, for her until death us do part. Until death us do part. She said her vows, until death us do part. And I want to tell you something. That is where I dedicated my life to my wife. She dedicated her life to me. She dedicated her life to me. And we became one. We became one. And I want to tell you something. In the eyes of God, we made a vow before God and before witnesses saying, we 
are all in hook, line, and sinker. And sorry for the pun, but when you get to this stage in your relationship with God, it's when you said, God, I'm inviting all my friends, I'm inviting all my family, and I'm going to get baptized where they can witness the commitment and the dedication I have towards you as my God. That is where baptism comes in. That is where God is saying, I see that. And there, suddenly, there's this word. It's called consecration. Consecration. Have you heard of the word consecration? Can we put up just that, the definition there of consecration? The act of dedicating yourself to the service and worship of God. There is a promise made. There's a vow made before God and before witnesses. And God sees this dedication, I'm consecrating myself. Lord, Lord, I'm going through the waters of baptism today. Why? Because I'm dedicating myself, hook, line, and sinker, to your plan and your purpose for my life. You have created me. You created me the way I am. Lord God, would you bless me? Would you bless my marriage? Lord, would you bless my walk and my relationship with you, my God and my Savior? In the front of witnesses, we have baptisms here. And what happens there? What happens then? God sees that consecration. God sees that consecration. And he says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you, right? And then the marriage is consummated. The marriage becomes consummated where two become one flesh in the physical and my relationship with my wife. And God says, there will be fruit. There will be fruit. And when you have consecrated yourself to God, God says, I'll pour out my spirit upon you and you will be fruitful in your walk and in your life with God as your father. Amen. Amen. Wow, man, this is amazing stuff. <sighs> oh, man, I've gone so way ahead of my notes here. Jesus himself, when Jesus got baptized, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says, says, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opening to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. In whom I'm well pleased. And I want to tell you here this morning, that's what baptism is. Jesus was the only person who ever walked the face of the earth that didn't need to be baptized because he had no sin. He had no sin. But when John the Baptist said, oh, not, not me baptize you. Jesus, you baptize me. He said, John, uh -uh, none of this. He said, we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness. John the Baptist then said, okay. And he went and he baptized Jesus. Heavens opened. Spirit of the Lord descends upon Jesus like a dove. Voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Why? Because he consecrated himself, set himself apart for the service of, of what he needed to do. Jesus himself being the example. What happened right after Jesus got baptized? He was led into the wilderness. Why? To be tempted. What happens is when you get baptized, the devil's unhappy because you've made a commitment and he's going to test that commitment. And I want to tell you something. Baptism is something of a reality. And I'm going to go through some of the quick points on what baptism is all about. But when you go down into the waters of baptism, it means that you go down into the water and you get immersed. The word baptism means baptizo. Right in the original Greek, which means to immerse, dunk like a Omar Rusk underneath the service, under the sea. You know that under the sea, that one. All right. When you get baptized, you've made a decision. God, this is a mature decision I'm making now. I'm dedicating myself. I'm consecrating myself for your work and your service. I'm going down under the sea. I'm going under the surface of the water. I'm going down. The old self dies 
is left behind, is buried. When you go down under into the waters of baptism, you are buried with Christ and you come out a new creation, washed by the blood of Jesus, clean. And where God says, I see this, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased, in whom I'm well pleased, in whom I'm well pleased. Who does not want to please the Father this morning? You've come to that level in your relationship where it's, God, I'm all in, hook, line, and sinker. The old self stays behind. Jesus was led into the wilderness. The devil will come and attack you and question you, question you. But what happened when you became baptized? He says, this is my beloved son. He gave you, he gives Jesus identity. He speaks identity over Jesus. When you go through the waters of baptism, Jesus, God the Father speaks identity. This is my child. This is my child. And you can go through temptation. Yes, you can be sub, uh, subjected to, to, to temptation, but it doesn't mean you succumb to that temptation. Amen? Amen? And then what happened right after Jesus was, was, was baptized and then he was tempted? Right when he came back, and then you start reading in Matthew chapter 5, he started his ministry. He started his ministry. And what happened was that. In the same way, Natalie and I got married, we consecrated ourselves to each other. We dedicated our lives to each other till death us to part. What happened was our marriage was consummated and we were fruitful and we've got three awesome children and that's fruit from our marriage. That's fruit from our marriage. I want to tell you something God is saying. I want to see that level of commitment, that dedication by going through the waters of baptism because I have plans and purposes for you to fulfill. If you stop at, I've given my heart to Jesus, do you know that where Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, you still, if you're at that level of your relationship with God, you can't baptize anybody yet. You can't baptize anybody if you've only said the sinner's prayer. Because only people who have been baptized can baptize. That means you can't fulfill the great commission, the last words Jesus spoke in his church. You cannot fulfill it unless you've been baptized. Oh Lord, would you open our eyes up to what you have, are opening up for our lives to step into the plans and purposes he's created you and me to walk into. There's so much more for you to step into. Wow. Wow. I've had this revelation of baptism this morning. I'm sharing this revelation of baptism with you here this morning. Oh, my word. Oh, my word. So how are we baptized? I've mentioned. Through immersion. Totally submerged. Why? So that the old self can stay there. I come out a new creation. I do not live the old way I used to live. The old self is buried. I come out a new creation living for God. When do we get baptized? Well, we read about it. We read about it. In Acts chapter 2, Peter gets up and he ministers the gospel to 3,000 people. They get saved and they get baptized right there and then. That's what happens. It's God's will for you to be saved. Personal relationship with God, one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me, washing me clean of my sins. I'm dedicated to your work. God, would you bless me and make me fruitful? Amen? Woo! We get baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You will not be baptized in any other name but the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's who I got baptized into. And I will never baptize anybody in any other name. Who can be baptized? Well, if you follow the process and the different levels of relationship. It's only, you can only get to level three in the relationship with God, the baptism level, once you've become a believer. Once you've become a believer. So we believe in a believer's baptism. My two-year-old girl cannot tell me why she wanted to be baptized. That's why I didn't baptize her when she was two years old. It's a mature decision. Do you see two-year-olds getting married? 
I'm asking the question, do you see two-year-olds getting married? It's a mature decision you make when you get baptized because you're making that decision, I'm dedicated to the work of the Father. I'm dedicated. And that's why we don't do infant baptism. It's called christening, not baptism. It's christening that. All right? And that's why we do baby dedications. Why? Because parents, and boy, I've got three kids, I know. You need help bringing up these kids. You need help. (laughs) That's why we dedicate children. Lord, give us wisdom in bringing up our children in, in your ways. That one day they will also make a decision to follow you and get baptized. Amen? Amen. And why do we get baptized? Because Jesus commanded it. And Jesus himself, who didn't need to be baptized, fulfilled all righteousness so that we could follow in his footsteps. Jesus was baptized a grown man so that he could show us the example of it. This morning, I'm trusting something amazing has happened in your heart in terms of baptism. I don't know if you've ever heard this teaching on baptism, but this was something I felt God give me for this church for you to know, what is baptism? Where am I in my relationship with God? Maybe you've walked in here for the very first time this morning and you want to know what, you want to get to know what you don't know. Then get through that stage. Get through that stage. Don't be a draad sitter. Don't go to stage 1.5 and stay there. God's got more for you. Respond to the gospel and respond in such a way where you say, Jesus, I have had a revelation of what you've done for me personally on the cross. But don't let it stop there yet either because you need to tell the world, invite your friends and family, get baptized because God says, you've had a personal, a personal revelation of me. Would you take that message now to the nations? That's where you get to after baptism. God wants to use you so much more than where you are right now, if that's where you're at. And this morning, I want to pray for us. I've come to the end of my preach. I want to pray for us. And I know there are people, well, there's two lots of people here. You've either been baptized or you haven't been baptized. I haven't left anybody out. I know that. I know that. But if you've been baptized, I trust God give you a fresh revelation of the task you've got at hand. That we need to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that in this church we've baptized over 100 people in the last 12 months? Over 100 people in the last 12 months. That's a lot of people. There is thousands more in this town that need to get to know Jesus and come to a point where they need to be baptized. Amen? So if you baptized, you need to know and have a new fresh revelation of the job at hand. If you're sitting here this morning and you have given your heart to Jesus, you're a believer, but you haven't been baptized, I believe the Holy Spirit is telling you this morning to take your relationship with Him to the next level. He wants to use you. He wants to use you where your fruit is so evident, where He uses you to baptize people. Because then you're qualified. Amen? And so I want to pray with you. I said to you, I want to pray. So Lord, I just pray for each and every single person here this morning. Holy Spirit, would you come down? Would you come here right now, Holy Spirit? And your word that has been preached here this morning, I pray for fruitfulness from this word. I pray, thank, and I thank you, Lord, that your word is going to be taken. It would be seed that is sown in each and every one of our hearts here this morning, and that we would allow it to grow. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would water, would water the seed that has been planted here this morning, so that we can step into the apostolic calling you've called us into as a church. Lord, we thank you that these are foundations that you are building in our lives, that we understand these foundations and that we can walk and run with the revelation of your biblical foundations in our lives. And Lord, I just pray a blessing upon each and every person here. Wherever they're at in their relationship with you right now, I pray that the next level is, is, is soon to happen. I pray your blessing, Lord Jesus. Bless these people, Lord God. Lord, I pray that they will fulfill the plan and purpose that you created each and every person here to live in. 
I speak life over you, church. I speak life over you in the name of Jesus here this morning. Bless your people, Lord God. Bless your people here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.